What's happening, guys? Welcome to another edition of Valhalla Life. We are well into our series now. Guys, today we have a very special guest with us, um, joining us. His name is Marcel Keats. Before that, I just want to introduce my in-house speakers again. We've got Charlotte Randon from Strength Society, and we've got James Peters Film. Guys, today, Russell Swanepoel, our CrossFit Shumba speaker. He's going to be absent. He might join us a little bit later. But until then, let's get on to our special guest for today. As I've mentioned, Marcel Keats. Guys, just a little bit of a breakdown, a little bit of um, some background on Marcel. Um, I was having a little bit of a think of it earlier. Charlotte sent me her very impressive CV, and it, it reminded me of the legendary Jeff Olson, the New Zealander who was both an all-black international and a black caps cricket international. Guys, today, Marcel comes to us with both SA Women's Hockey representing at two World Cups, one Commonwealth Games, and SA Water Polo at three FINA World Cups and two Commonwealth Games where they are actually the champs. So, guys, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us again. How's everyone doing today? All good. Yeah, I'm all good then. Eh? <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. So, guys, as usual, we're going to get into some questions that have been prepared for Marcel. Um, and I think, Charlotte, we're going to start us off today. How are you, Keetsy? Are you well? I'm good, thanks. And you? Thanks for having me on here. Always, always a pleasure. Um, I'm going to shoot from the hip with this one. Um, okay. Obviously, again, having looked at your CV, as Dane said, really, really impressive. Um, I'm sure that every sportsman has some regrets in their career um with you being so close to getting you know to those milestones of 50 caps in the pool and 150 um caps um for the national women's side um what are some of is it are, is that a, a regret first of all and what are some of your other regrets in your career um i love this question because if i had to take myself back to maybe um maybe five years, if I had to take myself back to five years, then I could give you a whole list of regrets that I've, um, you know, that I was thinking and stuff. But fast forward five years, I've got a little son, four, he's four years old now, Morgan. And then you really put your life into perspective. So I, I, if I, and I have often sat down and like thought back to my career and everything led me to different places in my life. And without having like some downfalls and some, um, you know, like failures and things, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I can't say that I have regrets. There's obviously things I would have liked to have changed, but it obviously it wouldn't have led me in my journey and my direction that I have now. Um, the, the, the cap story, it is kind of hard sore, but, um, so for hockey, I'm on 148 and if, um, same as like, um, you know, the rugby and the cricket, you always want to reach those milestones of like 50, 150, 200. You know, yeah. it's like that, that cream, that like cherry on the top. But I got, I was fortunate enough to get to 148. And, and I'm kind of looking back now, I don't really value my success on the number of caps because if I look at my career, I started in the ladies team um, in 2005. That was my first cap at Africa Cup. And my last cap was in 2016. So yeah. if I look back in my, my years, that was 11 years of national career. And for me, yeah. that is like way more than like any caps you could put together. Um, obviously, I would love to get the 150. Uh, but in 2016, I got something even better than 150 caps. I, got, I gave birth to my little dude, Morgan. So those two caps, oh, they're just going to have to stay there. And hopefully I can get it in my, my coaching career. The, the water polo, I'm still gunning for it. I'm, I'm still going to go for it. Um, okay. I had a big, I had a, yeah, yeah. I had a big thing um, a little beginning of this year. And because I had a back operation uh, last year, October, I had a fusion. And um, when you sit down in the upper, in the um, the room with the specialist, and he says to you, "You're never going to be able to do the sport that 
you you did do back you know, like it hits you like a brick. You think, oh my word, my life is over and everything is done. And so those days of recoveries were very dark, but as my body got stronger and better, um, I got more into like swimming, a lot of swimming. And um, with the possibility of the SA water polo going to the Olympics, it made my brain start ticking and yeah, I'm going to give it a bash, hey, and see see how that takes me. But I, I still feel good. Um, I still, my mind is still sharp in the water. So yeah. I'm going to give it a bash and see if I can get myself there. So yeah. regrets, yeah. not so much. Disappointments, loads. But um, I think everything's kind of made this journey so awesome. So I kind of like welcome the regrets and the disappointments. Um, just to just to touch on that, obviously you said you had eleven years of international hockey. Um, the market seemed controversial, but what would you say was your most successful um, yeah. little stint under a coach, or you know the most successful period for South African hockey under a coach, and yeah, why? Definitely. So um, in two thousand and twelve, after the London Olympics. Um, a coach called Giles Bonnet. He's originally from South Africa, from KZN area, I think. And um, he moved to um, the Netherlands and was working in the Netherlands for quite some time. So he had built up a massive resume. He was a former SA hockey player too. And he decided to take on the ladies team, which was, it was like, we kind of like catapulted into a professional um, setup with him because um, not only did he bring a bit of Dutch flavor into the ladies team, he, um, he bought, he got us all overseas and he got us to Belgium and Holland to play in the clubs there, which is like top hockey. He um, got a massive sponsor on board, um, Investec. And at that time, like Investec invested <laughs> uh, loads of money into our program. And obviously, you know, money, you know, money helps go massively. So we really, we were exposed to some of the best coaches out there. We were in a professional setup. We were playing top hockey um, overseas, top program. Um, And then um, not only that is like, if I had to think of the time that that Dallas took over in in that amount of, of years, we played more internationals than some of the teams before in over 10 year spell. So he had yeah, like a four year massive. stint and we played so many caps in that, I mean, in that short time, more than um, like South Africa hockey has ever managed to do. Also, yeah. uh, he, had, he had connections to um, obviously the Dutch. So we, we managed to play the Dutch many of times. Um, we had training camps in China where we went to China for like three to four weeks. We would train in China, literally eat, sleep, train, repeat every single day. So I think we just raised our bar massively with that time when we had Giles. And um, so for me in my career, that was our most successful, most professional time. Yeah. And I probably, probably, took um a lot out of you mentally and physically um Ooh. and then that that uh, that leads me to my next question what what would you say the biggest difference are in terms obviously we know the physicality of things but in terms of your mental state from going to you know from the turf into a pool uh, i kind of was very grateful that i had that experience from the hockey and the, the level of the intensity and um, environments during the, the hockey because um, the water polo was way less intense. So, you know, when there was like a, um, a certain tournament in that year, so say it was FINA World Champs in that year or Commonwealth Games in that year, the preparation would only take place in that year. And hockey was like 365 days for that you know, like the whole time. So it was almost like a little bit of a breather going into yeah. the water polo because it wasn't as professional. Um, 
So it was, it was kind of like a relaxing moment going from the intensity of the hockey program where, um, you know, it's constantly testing you mentally, physically. Um, you, you're trying to, you vie for that position every single day. And then going into the water polo, it's, um, it's a way less, um, it's like a relaxed environment. But it was also good for me that I could take in um, that experience that I had from the hockey and bring that to the water polo. So, you know, bring um, all, all that I experienced in the hockey, like um, just the mental challenges, a little bit more professionalism, and just take that into the water polo setup and, and kind of like mentor. I mean, I am a little bit older than some of the girls in the team. So, you know, <laughs> it, was a, it was a great time for me to mentor, you know, some of these other players. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I am honestly, I'm so grateful how it all worked out and how the setups kind of like, you know, complemented each other so much and was like perfect for me at that time. It gave you a sort of a, a nice little break, I suppose. Just, yeah, um, totally, yeah. totally. 100%. That's awesome. Um, I think we're going to move to Dane. Um, I know he's got a couple of questions for you. Yeah. Definitely. Guys, first up, um, just a quick one. I just want to say how's it to Russell. He's joined us. Um, guys, if you don't know, Russell has a very pregnant wife at the moment. So it's a little bit of a stressful time, but I'm really glad that he managed to join us. Russ, what's happening? How are you, man? Not too much. How are you guys doing? Hi, Russell. Yeah. Hello, Marzal. Nice to meet you. Thank you nice for spending you. your time with us. Yes, of course. Right, Marcel, coming from my side here, um, just a quick one. Like I mentioned earlier, off the top of my head, I don't know many sportsmen in any sport who have accomplished what you have in both, let's say, you know, hockey and water polo. Like I mentioned, only the legendary Jeff Wilson comes to mind who represented both rugby and cricket. So that's amazing. Just, um, yeah, I, I must applaud you. That's, uh, that's incredible. What I would like to know from you is... Can you give us an idea of how your physical training varied between the hockey and your water polo? I know that you've just mentioned that hockey was a lot more intense, um, the competition was a lot higher, and then your water polo was almost like a little bit of an escape. Did that mean that you concentrated a little bit more on training really hard for your hockey in the gym, or did you kind of balance it up a little bit you did a little bit more of some swimming and then obviously did your hockey was it kind of similar or was it different so i love this question because um you know it's actually so good for athletes out there to to hear about it and to know that it can be accomplished because i think that um a lot of the athletes and, and younger athletes too they try and um specialize a little bit too early and um they think that you know, like they don't want to burn out because they don't want to do too much. But um, I, I'm a living proof, okay? Well, firstly, I've, I have a lot of energy. <laughs> so um, if I can even take it back from when I was growing up, um, and I, I thank my parents for this, is that, you know, my, my dad is like, a, he was an SA canoeist and an SA karate. So he's got that background too. Plus he like, you know, does life-saving and everything. And um, so when we were younger, we had like a really, really good general base, which I think is so important. And um, I kind of kept that through my career. So um, we were at a young age, we were naturally quite like fit and strong. And I didn't really think about it too much when I was younger, obviously. But then going like... As you go through your career, you look back and you think, oh my word, all of that stuff held so much in my growth into my career. So if I can take it back, when I was younger, um, I, did, um, I did multiple sports, but not only that, it was like my dad had already started us doing like push-ups and sit-ups and squats and extra like running and um, general body weight exercises and I'm not lying to you it was like at the age of like five years old we were already starting to do this stuff he would make us like um stretch and do all those like um exercises those basic exercises before we got into the bath and when we woke up in the morning 
So um, we were like these little, like little machines when we were like little. And, and constantly through like my career, I always had that like, that ground of like um, uh, strength and a little bit of extra, you know, cardio and things like that because our family, if we went on holiday, we would wake up and we'd go for a run instead of like um, go to the to have a coffee. We would go and do those extra little bits. So yeah. into my career, I, I was very lucky that I had quite a, a good strength and base. And then as we got into the programs, um, the hockey program was way more professional. So if I had to say that the hockey kind of set you up for um, the gym, so it would give you that, that gym fitness, it would give you the cardio fitness, and that basis would help me so much in my water polo. So doing all of that would give me the strength and the, the um, endurance for into the water polo. You still, you know, water polo still is very much, um, it's a lot of grappling and a lot of like fighting in the water and a lot of like um, technical stuff in the water. So you can never get away with not doing a few sessions in the pool. But um, yes. what you can take away from the pool, all that practical stuff in the pool makes you so strong physically for when you step onto the hockey field. So, like, I had a lot more um, physical strength in, like, my tackles, in my, um, my power on, like, a, a slap with hockey or a hit in hockey. You know, I had a lot more, like, physical power because of the, like, alternating between the two sports. Um, the, the, then, because, you know, like, having that base as a youngster, you know, I, I mean, like, I did multiple sports. I did... Um, I did cross country, I did life saving, I did diving, I even did like last follow. I even did ballet up until matric. Um, and that's cross trainer of like the flexibility and the core and the, um, you know, overall, like it really did help my career all the way through because um, just generally setting up that good base in the beginning. Yes, absolutely. Um, just with that mention, I just want to move on to something, obviously it's, it's quite a low point for a lot of athletes in their career if it does occur. Um, you mentioned that in 2015 you, you obviously had to go in for a back operation. Um, just preceding that a little bit, throughout your career in both, or more so hockey I would imagine, did you ever experience any really bad injuries which put you back and if so how did you mentally come through that and what would you recommend to youngsters who let's say are pursuing a national sport and have suffered an injury and are thinking to themselves oh boy this is it I'm never going to be able to play the sports I love and represent my country so um yeah it's a, it's a such a tough time as an athlete to have that um that like block and to stop you in your like like how much you've done and then you have that injury i've had um a few injuries i've had you know like ones that have been really heartbreaking before 2008 beijing olympics i had that um that herniated disc in my back and that i was in the olympic squad and i i had that herniation and i obviously couldn't continue so that's a, that's a huge knock. Um, you know, luckily, I, I'd like to say I'm quite a grounded person. And, you know, you just have to kind of keep things into perspective. And I, I knew that I was quite young at that time. So um, I'm quite a positive person, you know. So um, I always have to, like, make sure I look on the bright side of things. And I've got... And what I would encourage athletes is, is to always keep that fight, you know, like to keep that determination and that fight for um, what you love so much. I mean, if you think about it in like a practical sense, if you had, um, you had like, for example, my son, you know, I would fight hard for him, you know, um, as a mother. And the same because I love him so much is that's what athletes need to find that they love their sport that much that they'll do anything it takes to get back to where they were. 
And um, so after that, you know, like I fought really hard and I trained really hard. And um, my family, uh, I come from a family that they're like, we're going to kick your ass if you don't get up and start training and stuff. So um, having a good support structure and having that like inner grit is massive. It's huge. So after that herniation, you know, I worked super hard. Um, the hockey family becomes, the hockey te like team becomes your family. You don't want to let them down and you want to get back to your family as well. So that was a huge motivation for me too. Um, so, you know, you, you get over those, those injuries. If I had to give like massive advice to youngsters now, um, which I had, I kind of had when I was younger, we, we are so stubborn as athletes. We, we are so, um, if I had to think back to my days when I had like a little niggle and um, we, we just kind of trained through it and then it gets worse and worse. We don't look after ourselves very well because we just want to be on the field. Um, we just yeah. want to play. We, we just want to train. And we're really stubborn and kind of a little bit stupid when we, when we are young that we don't look after ourselves very well. And, um, you know, I think that if we can educate and um, kind of get the athletes and the, the players and kids a little bit more mature in how they look after themselves, um, I think that will just extend a hell of a lot of careers, you know. Um, I think we live in a society in South Africa that we're really insecure about our positions in teams, our positions in a province, our positions in everywhere. We're so insecure that we think if I am not seen, then I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be included or, um, you know, I'm not going to be valued. So then we push ourselves until we burn out or we push ourselves until we injured. And I wish that we could educate and give that confidence to athletes to say, Hey, we're looking after you. We need you to like be mature about your body. Look after yourself. Um, and I think this, this education is really important for athletes. And I wish I had had that when I was younger so that I could like, um, kind of not, not abuse my body when I was in, when I was younger. So, um, I think that's a huge thing is that, and like even down to little things like eating right, sleeping right, um, training right, not overtraining, looking after those niggles, strapping your ankles if you've got bad ankles, you know. It seems so silly now, but if I look back, I wish I had done that to prevent, you know, like a lot of niggles that kept you out of the, you know, like a long career. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I love that what you just mentioned of you want or some of the players they want to be playing at national level, but the mentality and they, their head isn't really at that level yet, and they they're not taking it as this is this is really important, and I need to approach this in a very very professional manner, otherwise I will be risking the chance of sitting out for six months, nine months. Like, it's so it's so fresh to hear coming from you that you need to take this seriously if you do want to reach that highest level. So yeah, thank you for that. That's awesome. Um, I think next up we're going to move to Jamo. Uh, Jamo, you want to shoot a question there, please? So I just wanted to find out um, what the professionalism is like in both hockey and water polo. Um, sort of the improvement that you might have observed. Um, over a period of time yeah so i think there's been um a huge huge development if i can think from my under 21 years which was not that long ago <laughs> but um if i can think of um from when i was like in like the junior senior program till now i think that um and i'll speak from like a provincial and a school level because i think that is where a lot of the development has come in like leaps and bounds. So if I think of school setups now from today, it is way more professional, even in that structure. I think that um, the kids are getting so much more from a school environment already now that the rest of the levels are all stepping it up now too. So um, from when I was at school, it was, I mean, we wouldn't even dream of getting like um, 
a pro, a pro coach in to our school. We would probably have like the the teacher or a um, or get like a, a a family member or a dad or a mom to come and coach us. But now schools are really putting in a lot of time and effort and money in that um, structure to make sure that they are top. And this filters into the next level, the provincial level. So if I think of like um, the provincial setup, if I even think of like Shiloh, if I can like say, for example, the provincial um, ladies tournament last year. I mean, if I look at the teams there, the provinces were set up and I'm talking about hockey for now. I'll talk about water polo just now. At the hockey provincial, there was a team that had a trainer. And when I say trainer, I'm talking uh, a buyer that doubles up as a physio. So a buyer who does the, the training sessions, the rehab, looking after the teams, warm up, warm down. And then the physio, when they go back to um, the um, wherever they're staying. So they have that. Then they have a video analysis. So you've got somebody technically that's doing the video recording, you know, analyzing the games. This is massive. And then you've got the assistant coach who obviously is um, assisting with the head coach. That's for management. I mean, if we think back to about 10 years ago, you had one guy doing everything. And, and it's, um, it's all on a provincial level, you said. This is all a provincial level. So if, Charlotte, if I take your KZN team, you had coach, as coach, you had yourself, and then you had your video guy. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and a manager. Oh, and I'm sorry. Yeah, and manager. <laughs> so, so we've already stepped we've already stepped this up, and this is ladies level, but this is filtering down into the the schools level too. So there's five management already that that boosts your professionalism by massively. Everybody's doing their own job, so an athlete just has to be an athlete, and that's that's really so important for those tournaments and stuff. Then we get into the national program. And, and what we've done in the national program is um, creating like a massive community that is looking after the program from a junior level with consistency into the national level. So um, that's a huge step up from what we used to have, you know, let's say 10 years ago. And this is all starting already at like a school's level. So um, that is a massive step up. And not only with that, um, money is also getting invested in too. So, you know, there's like huge money being invested that from a, a school's level, like if I take the school I'm coaching at now, I've, I've sent them a program from the strength and conditioning. Then they will, um, they will obviously do this program and then they will come and have a hockey training session and then they'll have a, you know, like a tactical session too. This 10 years ago did not exist. You would literally just pitch up for one session at school. So now this is filtering into a provincial level with high performance hubs all around the provinces and then into the national setup. So um, this is a huge, a huge leap and I think it can only grow more and more for, um, for you know, for South Africa sport. Now, in the water polo setup, this, this uh, water polo is really a f massive, massive sporting setup. Um, I still think that they need to be a little bit more, um, you know, like they need to be a little bit more cohesive. At least the hockey, everybody's kind of walk working towards the same goal. And the water polo people are still a little bit stretched out and wanting to do their own things. But um, if I think to the SA schools, when you have the end of um, year tournament. At that tournament, there are, I mean, like there's teams from under 13, under 14, under 15, under 16, and then under 18, and that's boys and girls. Some teams have an A and a B team, and each team has a coach, an assistant coach, and a manager. So that's three management. So if you think about all the provinces that get together, at that tournament, it's it's just it's massive, and people are taking it more and more seriously um, at their schools and getting in those pro coaches, putting them on programs, 
They've got massive high performance centers at the school where they do their bio, they do their gym, etc. So So it's a it's a it's a massive step up, and um, I just think it's because you know people are invested and really passionate about the sport, and I think that that's just going to be growing more and more. Just just thinking back to when I was a kid, and I did my very first hockey practice. I think I was um, probably eight years old, and. Our teacher got us all together and she put us on the um, the outline of the hockey field and she said, right, here's a hockey ball. I want to see how straight you can hit this hockey ball along this line. And just by that, she determined if you were going to go and play for the game or not play in the game. Like that was, that was her little system. And obviously she was a teacher. She had no real experience in hockey training whatsoever, but um it's good to know that we've progressed from that. Yeah, that, that, so that's exactly what I'm saying. So now if you want to be, um, you know, schools are more and more like, if I think of um, the intake, let's say in like a high school of your grade eights, let's think of like a, the area of KZN. And, you know, academics have become like, everybody is kind of following the same academic program. You can't really over exceed that academic program unless you you know like bring in maybe different subjects or things like that but that academic program is kind of a base but then when you really start comparing schools and when you think of sending your kid you start looking at their cultural program their sports program and then with the sports program you're looking at who your children are going to get coached by um, what's their program like and that is a massive factor of schools and how they are recruiting people to come to their schools. And then obviously with that is the financial, you know, um, intake and that just boots the school. So everybody is actually becoming way more professional and way more, um, you know, um, concerned about the sporting um, setup, which I mean is awesome. I wish I had this when I was at school. <laughs> For sure, yeah. No, well, I can understand that. I mean, you 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 get it in in rugby, um, at least within South Africa. Um, so it's, you know, hockey is just the next one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Cool. So Thank you so, so much. we are eventually, yeah, we are now like um catching up to the cricket and the the rugby, which I think is amazing because people are starting to realise that the small percentage of the rugby, um. All the other sports need to filter on that to cater for all the children. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass over to Russ. Hey, Marcel. Um, yo, so, many, so many cool questions and mostly so many cool answers just before me. I'd, I'd like to sort of follow James and not my scripted question, but follow James and uh, Dane's question. Um, you mentioned earlier what I took away from it. Obviously, there's been a lot of developments in, in coaching quality now and sort of lots of uh, improvement in the standards of professionalism around the, the players themselves, tournament-wise and just in training and the program start to finish, it seems. Um, over and above sort of the, the, the science of the training itself, has there been an improvement in the mentorship of players to relate to what you were saying earlier about like um, managing injury, managing development, managing, um, I don't want to say how you handle failure and rejection, but like almost the, the holistic approach to players. Because a lot of players get, I imagine, a lot of players kind of fall off the wagon or they kind of lose track. And there's, there's often what I find, coaches are not equipped to deal with that. They don't know what the fuck is going on. They're like, okay, cool. We're just next in line. Come on, whatever. And that's fine yeah. for the team perspective. The team does have to move forward. But has there been a development in terms of sort of, and I'll speak from coach and player, has there been development of mentorship and understanding and how we, we actually keep players focused? And I mean, it's a huge open-ended question, but can you speak to that a little? I think that, no, I absolutely love that question because um, 
that is kind of one of my core values as a person and like a, and as a coach, you know, like that, that EQ, that empathy and like stuff with how to deal with players, because I honestly believe in this day and age, you know, we, we're so fortunate and athletes are so fortunate that you have access to these amazing trainers and these amazing gyms and bios and, you know, everybody can really transform themselves as a, like as a person into an athlete physically, you know, it's all accessible. But a lot, a lot of people are battling with this. And, you know, like, you can't just go to a gym and access a psychologist. You know, they're, they're kind of hard to find. And um, I also think we've got such like a, um, a bad rep on psychological and, um, you know, asking for advice and um, asking for help and um, a mental thing. I think we've, also, we've got such like a negative aspect on that. It's like, if you're asking for all of that stuff, it's, it's deemed as um, you weak. And I hate that. And um, I really think that that needs to, to change in sports. And at a national program that has already changed, there's um, pretty much all the teams have had um, sports psychologists involved and mental coaches. Like I remember my best, I remember my best experience in the national program. Like Shiloh, this is going on to your question. One of the most awesome experiences that Giles brought in um, three psychologists. He, he brought in every single aspect in the national program. So we had Cheryl Calder from the iGym bringing in that aspect of, um, you know, training your, your eyes and reaction timing, which was like another aspect of athlete. Then we had two psychologists that came in. And like this just transformed our whole outlook on teams and individuals and how we approach each other and everything. Um, so, so that was huge for me. But unfortunately, Russell, it hasn't filtered down into provincial and it hasn't filtered down into um, schools, which kids are like desperately needing this at the moment. They're really desperately yeah. needing this at the moment. There's so much anxiety with kids nowadays with, and like failure is, it's like huge. I don't know what has happened. I think that maybe with like social media and, um, I think with sorry, <laughs> I think with like social media and Instagram and Facebook and how many likes you get and how many like um you know how much um, feedback you get in I think that that's really creating like a um you know a massive anxiety for kids nowadays so like um they can't just walk off their hockey game feeling like they had a good hockey game with their coach saying yes well well played they need to have a thousand likes on Instagram to get that gratification that they're doing well. And, um, you know, so I think that this is really, really needed at like a school level and then into the, the next level, because if you can educate them at that, that school level, when they step into that, um, you know, that age group where you said we lose a lot because they fall off the bandwagon, they will be educated in how to deal with their emotions and failures and successes even, because some, some kids also don't know how to deal with successes. Um, so if we educate them at that school level, they know how to handle themselves into the next step. And they're not afraid to, you know, like reach out and help out and mentor um, the next generation. So I, I really do think that, um, we, we need to get a hold of that. And there are some schools and, and like, it's so typical. It's like the schools, it's like the, um, it's the um, private schools, you know, it's the private schools that have like the psychologists on board. Um, but I almost feel like this is just my thought is that if you have a coach that wants to get their levels in, let's say, um, for SA hockey, you have to do your coaching levels. I honestly think that while you're doing your coaching levels, you need to do um, a psychology level with that so that you know how to handle your players because it's all well and, you know, fine when you're like shouting tactics on the side of the field, but then you've got a kid that has no idea how to handle um, 
you know, pressures on the field. So you can speak X's and O's for as long as you want, but this kid is really battling to just pull themselves together to step onto the field. So I think that they're yeah. not only like the kids to get educated, the coaches also need to get educated with um, coaching as well. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think it's it's a very difficult area to formalize firstly, but I sort of, my, and I feel very strongly about this as well. And I, yeah. But I think that, these soft skills are things that coaches really need to start, specifically coaches really need to start embracing because the more sort of information that you, you can give and the more encouragement and confidence that you can give to your players, your, the, the team performs just sort of significantly, exponentially more, uh, more effectively. Um, I know I found a saying the other day that I really, really embraced and was sort of be the mentor that you wish you had. I think yeah. the more coaches we can see uh, taking that on rather than clinging to talent, sort of just finding that one really exceptional kid and, and sort of sticking to them, the better we will be as a sort of as a sporting community and the more you can give. But anyway, that's another conversation, but it sort of leads into the next Yeah, one. we could chat forever on that because I'm very passionate about that, but I, I uh, yeah. absolutely agree, yeah. Um, so the concept of a double international, which you really is incredible, is fantastic. But as we sort of go down this line of uh, professionalizing or advancing sports, is that element going to be lost as we sort of, I don't want to say specialize earlier, but as we have to put more energy into the sports earlier on? And, and like, I think it's a, it's a really sad thing. I mean, it's at schools, you see kids are able to, very special kids are able to be double internationals, but, um, and I think it's important. Can, do you think that's something we can keep going with or that, we, that is sustainable or attainable? So um, I think retainable is like spot on there because I think that if we had to look at like the, the age groups, um, we lost the age group of the kids that are now between 16 to 25. We've lost this era, like as of today, I think we lost that era because um, we were just progressing from like non-professional into professional. So those coaches and stuff were only focused about winning and being the best and um, being the best team in the province. And I think that era of coaches, um, you know, wanted their pound of flesh out of a player. So I think they, they you know, like they really drove the player to only choose the one sport and focus on that sport. But I honestly feel that um, the new generation, like the youngsters from like 11 years old to 15 years old, like now, I really think that, um, you know, with this like people starting to think about more cross training and more overlapping in sports and, and you know, like keeping a holistic environment for a kid, I really think we are gonna retain, you know, kids that can, can double over. And um, I think that we, we can bring it back and with the new age of um, coaches and like, um, I mean, us sitting here, the, we are kind of the new age people that are approaching these athletes and encouraging these athletes to do and to put, like pursue their talents. So I have, a, I have a feeling that they will come back and, um, and I think it's because of a few coaches that are going to encourage it. But you will always have your coaches and your systems that will say, you are good at swimming. You need to just focus on your swimming. Or, um, you know, they, they want to win the championship game. So they need that player to um, only play their hockey team. And um, I think that mindset is changing a little bit. And I, and I have a feeling that we will be bringing back the kids um, so that they can like overlap into their sports. But oh, man, it's, um, it's a catch 22 because if we're not all on the same page, we can't approach the athletes to encourage them to do all of this because you're gonna have the one hockey coach saying you have to play hockey and you're gonna have the one water polo coach saying, um, 
it's okay, we'll manage it. You can play your hockey game and then just come five, lim five minutes late for your water polo game. So if, if we can get the support structures in place, like the parents and the coaches on board, you know, then we will make a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of headway. But yeah, it's, it's, it would be, it would it's be a tough I feel, one. it is a tough one. And um, the, more, the more parents I'm speaking to nowadays, um, they are more open to it. As if I had to look back eight years ago, five years ago, parents were more worried about their kids being at every single hockey training so that she didn't miss out on making the first team. But now speaking to these type of parents, they're saying, no ways. I want my kid to go and play the cricket game and then come over and play the water polo game. And um, I want them to experience as much as they can. So I, I hear little bits of change, but um, yeah, when it gets down to the nitty gritty, I'm not too sure. I know that me as a parent, I'm going to want Morgan to do as much as possible. I know that that's going to be my outlook to him. So I know what, what I'm going to control. And I yeah. will try and encourage as many people as possible to, to do that as well. Yeah, definitely. I also value sort of a, a broader variety of, of sort of pursuits, especially when you're younger. I mean, you've got to get out yeah. and experience as many things as you can. Um, and it, I mean, for you, it was such contrasting sports being water polo and, and hockey. Do you think, and I don't know if you played like cricket or, or anything like that. Do you think if the sports were closer, uh, more similar bracketed like that, do you think you would have been able to, to have as much fun and pursue them both as much? So I was, I was actually chatting about this to my folks the other day. And I was like saying to them, guys, why don't you put me in sports like tennis and golf and like like sports that could like earn me money and stuff um so they were like you know what you you were so happy with the environment and the sports that you were in you know we didn't make you choose and we didn't um you just gravitate towards those areas and um and i think that was that was so good is that that and i'm very grateful for my parents and my support and obviously I had a, an, a sister that was two years older than me and I did everything that she did. So, um, you know, like, I do often think about, um, you know, like different sports and if, what happens if I had maybe like concentrated on that, but then it would, I wouldn't be Marcel Keat. I wouldn't be me at this point in this journey because um, if I had to have gone to tennis, you know, like I think, I wouldn't be the type of person I am now. So um, if I think of all the different sports that like, you know, I could have like gone into, um, I don't think it would have brought me the success and the family and the, the journey that I've been through like now. That's but awesome. Maybe I, maybe, like, I will go into, maybe I will go into golf like now, late, later <laughs> on in my life. <laughs> Shall I can give you tips on turning pro there? No, I saw, I saw. He'll definitely be my caddy if I make it to the <laughs> the Masters. <laughs> but I, know, I can I can hit the ball really it's the closest far. Closest he's got. <laughs> the, short, the short game, I suck. The short game, no, I suck. We can work on the short game. That's where you make yeah. your money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's still speaking from his riches. <laughs> <laughs> um, Master, I've just got another question here. I think we'll maybe shoot off one or two more questions before we start wrapping up. Um, something you said just caught my ear quickly there. It's um, why you, you asked your parents, why didn't you, uh, you get me in sports that would make me money? I know that um, in the, the SA hockey scene, I know, potentially the funding isn't as great and often we see our younger athletes are seeking more opportunities abroad. I know in cricket, rugby, other sports, that is a very big problem in SA where good young talent is being scouted by, let's say, overseas teams to go and play abroad 
and obviously develop their careers, earn money, etc. What do you think can be done, especially in the hockey scene, to prevent our young talent from, let's say, heading over to the Netherlands, heading over to Australia to really develop their hockey further? How do you think SA can try and keep their players and really push them to, uh, let's say, greater hearts and to be better players? Um, so, like, I've got a like a two part to that that um, that question. It's, my first part would be that um, I, I almost um, encourage encourage players to go and play abroad to get the experience and the the different dynamic and different coaching styles and different um, you know experience in that aspect. So I encourage them to go abroad. But oh, uh, also, okay. while, they, while they are going abroad and learning and experiencing, they need to bring that back with them. So that they, we shouldn't lose them to that country. We want them to learn and grow, you know, from that country, but then also come back with it. So that's one part. Yeah. The second part is that um, if we don't want to lose these players, we got to... Um, and I, and I really believe that we can professionalize our sport. It's, it's the varsity section that we're losing these players in this varsity. And I know that um, in the hockey, if I think of the hockey, um, we've got the varsity cup, which is great. It's growing. It's providing money. I mean, the players, if they, if they are player of the game, they get um, a voucher and, um, of, of money. They, they win money. You know, we've got the PHL that's going, which is huge. It's, it's very prestigious as a hockey player. You want to play on that platform to get noticed, to get there. You're also getting paid. So I think we're on the right, like, the right process in the hockey and we are, yeah. we are getting the professionalism and we're getting um, a bit of the finance too. So it's just, we've just scratched the surface on it and um, we're heading in the right direction. And I think we're going to get more and more investors in it because, you know, like, it's a game that kind of gets under your skin, hockey. You really, like, um, it, it's starting to, you know, get more people um, with their eyes open and having a look and stuff. Um, if I think of, like, um, water polo, I think we need to kind of, like, reciprocate what you're doing with the hockey into the water polo structure, too. Because once the kids, like, um, they hit matric, then everything starts to become very... Um, the grass is always greener on the other side. And, um, you know, they want to go overseas because they believe that they'll get more of an opportunity overseas, which is true at this moment. It is true if I think of the water polo. If I think of, like, a, a girl that's at the school now, and she's super talented, if she leaves school now and goes into a varsity setup here in South Africa for water polo, you know, she's going to have, like maybe two practices a week, maybe. The only water polo competition she's going to have is one, one week of inter-provincial tournament, and then that's it. But where she goes overseas to America, she's going to be put in like a proper program and structure where they train every single day. So her varsity gets paid for, her physio gets paid for, she has a program that she has to fulfill every single day. Like she has to go to the gym. She has to go to the swimming set. She has to go to the training session. So, um, you know, it's like we need to bring that into the um, university setup. And I think, Shiloh, you're involved with like VC, hey? Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I see it happening more and more often in the, in the varsity setup with the hockey. It's super professional. You know, and that's happening in the, the hockey setup. But when I think of, like, you know, the Cinderella sports like water polo, it's not so much. But hockey, hockey is on its way and it's, it's doing really well. Yeah. Excellent. Well, yeah, those are some amazing points there. I think, uh, gents, we're going we're gonna to move towards a little bit of a wrap up here today. Um, does Can anyone I have else one have any more questions? question? Yes, yes. I was just about to ask. Go for it. What do you think about Shiloh's hockey stick sponsorship? 
Who is your sponsor? <laughs> I signed with Princess. <laughs> oh, cute, Charlo. Cute. <laughs> No, it's, it's actually just brought brought me on to, to model to model clothes and you know. <laughs> well, congratulations! It's a lovely it's a lovely product. <laughs> if you were in, if you were in like um, Europe, you'd be getting like washing machines and fridges and stuff like that too. So exactly, that's that's the goal, you know. <laughs> at, least you a, at least you get a pretty pink stick this time. I might go for the Hello Kitty one. The pink oh, one that they have. <laughs> um, just something from my side. I think we left this off your CV, but um, didn't you win the PHL yeah. with the Bunters? Uh, twice. Twice. So there you have it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Jeepers. we did. That's amazing. Jeez. Yeah, that was, wow. So my, my first year with the Bunters was with an um, amazing coach, Lindsay Carlisle, Lindsay Wright. She, um, she was SA captain, and I was fortunate enough to play with her. I was coached by her in under 21, and then I got to get mentored by her at the PHL, and we won it that year, and it was, it was, uh, it was amazing. And, and having that experience under her as a coach really, um, you know, really helped me out for my coaching career. Then my first year as the head coach, then we won it with the Bunters team, so... Yeah, very cool. Incredible. Right, guys, uh, I think that's all we got time for today. I just want to thank everyone for coming in today. Our in-house speakers, Russ, Shiloh, Jamo, gents, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come and chat with us. And then a huge, huge thank you to our guest today, Marcel Keith. Thank you so much for spending your time chatting to us. I mean, your, your CV speaks for itself. And I think what you've spoken about today will serve as awesome inspiration for those young athletes out there, whether it be hockey, water polo, really to kind of keep their heads on straight and to just kind of keep fighting as you um, described throughout your career that you did. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. Right, guys, that's all we have today, or all we have time for today, should I say. Thank you so much for joining us here on Valhalla Life. We'll be back next week for another edition. Cheers. See you then.